Mr. Pigsney by Reggie Oliver Performed by Kristen Holland It was, I suppose, a typical gangster's funeral. There were the extravagantly insincere floral tributes to Reg a diamond geezer in white carnations. There was My Way, played by the reluctant organist. There was the coffin borne by six burly black-coated thugs into a church which Reg would never have entered in his lifetime, except to marry or to bury. And why was I, Houseman Professor of Classical Epigraphy at Cambridge University there? Well, my sister, in some unaccountable hour of rebellious madness, had once married the late Reg McCall's younger brother, Den, and borne him two sons, before finally divorcing him and marrying a merchant banker instead. Because my sister Gwen simply could not face the funeral, and it was still a vacation, I had been deputised to accompany my two teenage nephews, Robert and Arthur, to the obsequies. Reg had no living children. His daughter Janet had predeceased him in a dreadful drug fueled car crash some years previously, so Robert and Arthur were possible heirs. It would have shown disrespect that great gangland sin had they not been present at their uncle's interment to be honest on the few occasions i had met reg i had rather liked him certainly i always preferred him to den a cold fish if ever there was one of course i knew that reg had been a ruthless underworld tyrant of the old school i knew that he'd had people slapped the criminal's euphemism for beaten up and even cut, knifed, for betraying him. I knew that he had run protection rackets and brothels and masterminded bank raids, and that he had once personally killed a man. The victim's name apparently was Maltese Percy, and the deed had been done in the cellars of the Dog and Gibbet in Hoxton. Everyone knew what had happened, but there were, of course, no witnesses. I had also discovered that his proud boast that he never had anything to do with drug dealing was a lie, given out for the benefit of journalists eager to perpetuate the myth of the lovable rogue. Nevertheless, I had liked him. Because our paths would never have crossed other than for family reasons, Reg and I could take a dispassionate interest in one another. I heard that Reg used to boast about me to his cronies. My brother-in-law, you know, the Cambridge professor. And I must admit that I have occasionally dined out at high tables on him. At family gatherings, Reg was a lavish and attentive host, with the kind of courtesy, when he had a mind to it, that had earned him the sentimental East End reputation of being a real gentleman. In my experience, real gentlemen don't have people cut or slapped and rarely kill petty criminals in pub cellars. But let that pass. He was genial and friendly towards me. Unlike his brother Den, the quiet one, the backstairs fixer of the outfit, who always gave the impression of harbouring a grudge against the world. I had been hoping, rather unrealistically perhaps, that once we had seen the body safely interred in the little Essex churchyard, my nephews and I could slip away. But, of course, it was not to be. We were asked back to the house, and it would have been disrespectful to refuse. We were even offered a lift in Reg's widow's stretch limousine because we had arrived at the church by train and taxi. Even before we entered the limousine, I sensed an atmosphere. Den was already there, and Reg's widow Maureen was tucked into a corner. She was a small, neat woman who had retained her figure and her striking blonde hair with a strenuousness that showed in her face. Though she was barely in her mid-fifties, she looked ten years older, withered and pinched by anxiety. She glared at us from her corner while Den explained the situation briskly to her. Larry here and the boys are coming up to the house with us, all right, Maureen? That last question expected no reply and got none. My name, incidentally, is not Larry and never has been. It is Lawrence, Professor Lawrence Chibnall. I knew the reason for the atmosphere 
and could, to some extent, sympathise with her. Now that Reg was dead, from natural causes, incidentally, what little importance Maureen possessed in the McCall family hierarchy would dwindle to nothing. Den had already assumed a greater measure of control over the firm after Reg's first stroke eighteen months before. Now the takeover was complete. Maureen would be comfortably off, but she would be ignored. Had she had sons as Den had, the role of matriarch might still be hers. My nephews, Robert and Arthur, were behaving well. They did their best to ignore Maureen's resentful, tear-stained stare and talked quietly to each other about neutral subjects. They were both at good public schools. Though they had been taught by their mother to hate Den, they had the sense never to show any hostility. I was amused to learn from them that the fact that their father was a notorious underworld figure was regarded as cool by their schoolfellows, and they were more than happy to take advantage of the fact. Just before we set off for the house, someone else joined us in the limousine. Though there was plenty of room, Den tried to prevent it on the spurious grounds that the car was reserved for close family only. But Maureen, for once, asserted herself. It's all right, she said. It's Mr. Pixney. Oh, yeah? He was very close to Reg when he was dying. Let him in, Den. The man who clambered aboard was very small, almost a dwarf, with a disproportionately large head. Long strands of sparse red hair had been combed across his domed cranium and lay there, lank and damp, like seaweed on a rock after the tide has retreated. He wore a neat black suit and black tie and, somewhat incongruously, a dark red rose in his buttonhole. He sat himself beside Maureen, smiling and nodding at the rest of us. Den had decided to ignore him altogether, so I introduced myself and the boys. Mr. Pigsney shook hands smilingly with all three of us, but, as far as I can remember, said nothing. The drive to the house took place in the purring near silence of the great black limousine, punctuated only by the occasional sniffle from Maureen. Reg's house was a detached mock Tudor mansion in an avenue of similar leafy refuges just outside Thurrock, that part of Essex being the place where all good criminals go to die. The lawns were clean-shaven, the gravel deep in the drive, the Leylandii high and dense enough to frustrate any casual intruder. When we arrived, a number of suited men with thick, impenetrable faces were cluttered importantly on the drive, like staff officers before a battle. Inside, the house was spacious, and, though Sir Terence Conran might have shuddered, the decor did not reek of the kind of vulgar ostentation so often favoured by the criminal fraternity. There was, however, something of a clash of styles. Maureen had gone in for the prettiness of the glazed chintz variety. The drawing-room was in light pastel shades, and the porcelain figurines on the mantelpiece were complemented by the pink Dresden shepherdesses on the wallpaper. Reg's study and other parts of the house showed his more manly taste for dark oak and cherry-coloured leather. He owned one or two genuinely good pictures and antiques, in particular a magnificent blue and white Ming vase, about four feet high, decorated with dragon motifs. I had once expressed my admiration for it. You're not going to ask me where I got it or how much I paid, are you? He said. My dear Reg, I wouldn't dream of asking such sensitive questions, I answered. For some reason, Reg found my reply extremely funny. I think he found me extremely funny sometimes. I don't resent that, but I am slightly baffled. Very few of us are good at finding ourselves funny. Our stretch limousine was one of the first vehicles to arrive at the house, but very soon people were coming thick and fast for the wake, and Reg's mansion began to feel uncomfortably small. Cups of tea were being drunk, sweet sherry sipped, sandwiches devoured. My nephews were very soon engulfed by the crowd. I had tea accidentally spilled over me by a huge man with a shaven head. Almost immediately after the accident he was being berated by a little black-eyed woman in spectacles who then turned to me. I'm so sorry, Professor, she appeared to know who I was. 
My Abby can be very clumsy sometimes, she said. Now you apologise nicely to the professor. I accepted a mumbled apology from the man. Introduce yourself properly, Horace, she said to him. You know what I keep telling you about your manners? This is my husband, Horace, and I'm his better half, Enid. I'm the Oxton Strangler, said the man. That's right, Horace, said his wife. You're the Oxton Strangler, aren't you? But that's just like his stage name. He's a wrestler, you see, professional. We decided to call him the Oxton Strangler. I shook a warm, sweaty boxing glove of a hand and would have liked to talk to him about the world of professional wrestling, but it was not to be. The Hoxton Strangler had a very rudimentary grasp of the art of conversation, and soon the tide of people tore us apart. I wanted to go home, but my nephews were nowhere to be seen. To escape the noise and the heat, I decided to take refuge, if possible, in some less crowded part of the house. I peered into various rooms, only to find them noisily occupied. Eventually, I tried the door of Reg's study, which I had expected to be locked. It was not. It looked like the study of a cabinet minister. The furnishings were rich and sombre. The books on the shelves were mostly leather-bound, doubtless bought, or stolen, by the yard. I had been in this room before, but I had never before realised how pretentious it all was. Reg had been fooling himself that he was a man of consequence, a statesman of some kind, though probably he had kept up the pretense as much to impress others as for his own egotistical benefit. Hello, what the fuck are you doing here? I started and looked round to see Den was sitting at the desk in the window bay. He had been sorting through papers. Naturally, he was not pleased to see me. He said, I suppose you've come for your vase, have you? I beg your pardon? The vase, that bloody blue thing. He pointed to a shelf where stood the exquisite Ming vase, innocent, untainted by the surrounding vulgarity and deception. I have no idea what you're talking about. Don't give me that. You know perfectly well Reg left it to you in his will. Here, he said, waving a sheaf of papers in his hand. It says so, here. How very generous of him. I had no idea. Yes, well. Just take the thing and F off, will you? I can't do that. It should go through probate and so on. Look, mate, what do you want? I was beginning to find my ex-brother-in-law extremely irritating. I said, I don't want anything. I just want to find my nephews and take them back to their mother as soon as possible. Well, they're not here, and I've got work to do. There was a knock on the door. Bloody hell, said Den. This was apparently taken as an invitation to enter, because the door opened and in came Mr. Pigsney. He was carrying a black portfolio case, which had not been with him in the limo. Oh, it's you, is it sure does? said Den. What do you want? I'll leave you gentlemen to it, I said, making for the door. But Mr. Pigsney barred my way, holding up his hand, palm outwards, like an old-fashioned traffic policeman. Though small, there was a curious air of solidity and authority about the man. If you don't mind, Professor Chibnall, I would prefer you to stay, said Mr. Pigsney. After all, you are, as I understand, co-executor of the late Mr. McCall's will with Mr. Dennis here. I looked at Den in amazement. He made a face. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I was going to tell you, only I didn't think you'd want to be bothered with all the detail. I sat down in one of Reg's masculine leather armchairs, too astonished to say anything. I also understand, went on Mr. Pigsney, that I am mentioned in the will. If you're expecting any money, said Den aggressively, you're out of luck, chummy bum. Mr. Pigsney sat down uninvited in the chair opposite Den. I was not expecting any remuneration. Mr. McCall and I agreed about that before his decease. All right, said Den. There's something in the will about retaining you as an advisor and that, but it's not legally binding. I could have my brief overturn it just like that, and you'd be out on your ass, mate. Mr. Pigsney sat quite still for a moment, apparently quite unmoved by Den's threat. Then he said, I have something to show you, gentlemen. 
He opened the portfolio and took out what looked like an unframed and unmounted black and white engraving printed on heavy art paper roughly the size of an A3 sheet. He then rose from his chair and walked over to a circular table in the centre of the room. Having swept the books and papers on it unceremoniously to the floor, he laid out the print on it with almost reverential care. Den and I had been too astonished to move until Mr. Pigsney beckoned us over to examine the item. For a good thirty seconds we both looked at it in silence. I doubt if we so much as breathed. From behind Reg's thick study door came the faint lugubrious murmur of the wake. It was indeed a monochrome print of some kind, though whether it was an engraving, an etching or a lithograph I am simply not qualified to say. The style of it was vaguely antique, possibly Victorian, but no particular artist sprang to mind. Perhaps there was a hint of Gustave Doré about it, but it was certainly not by him. Whoever had done it possessed an extraordinary skill and power. All these reflections I give as afterthoughts, because what possessed me at the time was the image itself. Under a lowering sky of thick, dirty cloud was stretched a vast frozen lake. Its distant edges were fringed with jagged, pitiless mountains whose peaks and ridges were laced with snow. In the middle distance a number of figures were skating aimlessly about on the surface of the lake. They were human, apart from their heads, which were those of birds, reptiles, or insects. The foreground was dominated by a single figure standing rather unsteadily on the ice in his bare feet. He wore a shapeless baggy overall that vaguely resembled an ancient prison uniform. What shocked us most was the face of the man, because it was Reg McCall to the life. The expression on his face was not so much of horror as of resentful despair. He looks out of the picture directly at us. Perhaps he pleads. What is this shit? said Den. Who did it? There was menace in his voice, as if he were threatening to punish the artist responsible. I wonder if you gentlemen could be seated once more, said Mr. Pigsney. I obeyed, and so, to my surprise, did Den. Mr. Pigsney said, The picture was commissioned by Mr. McCall before his death. It depicts his present existence in hell. I saw Den's mouth gape. I am sure he wanted to say something, but he was as incapable of speech as I was. He looked at me, and I felt a tiny spark of fellow feeling pass between us. Naturally, this is not a precise and naturalistic depiction. That would be impossible given the circumstances, but it does represent a reality. Was it not Picasso who told us that art is a lie which tells us the truth? Piss off, Pigsney said Den. And again I felt at one with him. I could not have put it better myself. Who's a little shit who drew that crap? I'll wring his bastard neck for him. The artist in question is beyond even your reach, Mr. McCaw, said Pigsney, putting the print back into his portfolio and preparing to leave the room. Den barred his way. He said, What's the point of all this, Pigsney? Tell me what you want. Come on, out with it. And don't miss me about. I warn you, I don't like being messed about. Surprisingly few people do in my experience, Mr. McCall. As to what I want, I want nothing. It was your late brother who wanted you to see the picture. You may wish to reflect on it, as he intended you to do. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I will be calling on you both. In due course... With that, Pigsney left the room, unhindered by Den, who seemed shattered by the whole experience. Fuck me, he said eventually, after a long silence. As I could not contribute anything more cogent myself, I remained silent until my nephews Robert and Arthur burst into the room. Is it okay if we go now, Dad? said Arthur. We've said our goodbyes to Auntie Maureen, and she's now gone into a huddle with that ghastly piggy man who was in the limo with us. Den waved us away wearily, almost graciously. 
Within a month or so, my rooms at Cambridge were graced by the Ming vase. I rang to thank Den for its safe delivery. He dismissed my gratitude quickly. "'Has that pigsney been on to you?' he asked. "'No. Have you seen him, then?' "'No. So what's the fucker up to?' "'I can't say I'm bothered.' "'Yeah, right. But that's all very well. I mean, he must be up to something. I mean, who is he? Where's he come from? What's his bloody game?' I had no answers for him, so the conversation ended inconclusively, but by the end of it he had managed to infect me with some of his unease. It was May, and in the gardens of King's College some undergraduates were performing the Orestes in its original language. I like to keep my acquaintance with Greek literature in good repair, and encourage it in others, so I went. It was a warm evening, and I must admit my attention wandered. The diction of the actors, somewhat hampered by masks, was not good enough to hold me, and I began to lose the thread of the Greek. The words transformed themselves from meaningful sentences into an alien music. The wooden seating for the audience was tiered and in a horseshoe shape, like an ancient auditorium. I was seated near to the bottom of one extremity of the horseshoe, so that I had as good a view of the audience as I did of the action on stage. I began to watch the watchers. About halfway up the other side of the auditorium, almost directly opposite me but higher, sat a man I thought I recognised. I had spotted him first because he was dressed differently from the rest of us. Instead of loose, summery clothes, he wore a dark suit and a tie. He was short, and he covered his baldness with a rather nasty comb-over of greasy reddish hair. It was Mr. Pixney. His appearance at such an event seemed to me so bizarre that it took me quite some time before my mind would authorise what my senses told me. After that I ignored the play completely and divided my time between taking furtive glances at him and speculating on his possible motives in attending an undergraduate performance of a play in Greek. His whole attention was fixed on the action on stage, and it did not look as if he had noticed me. Eventually there was another chorus about vengeance and the guilt of the house of Atreus, and an interval was declared. I toyed with the idea of leaving, but I was too curious about Mr. Pigsney. I found him over by the makeshift bar in the cloisters, sipping tomato juice. Hello, Professor Chibnall. Fancy seeing you here. He spoke to me with a condescension I had expected to use towards him. I didn't know you were a devotee of classical drama, I said. Oh, yes, these... Olden-time Greeks, they knew a thing or two, didn't they? You're finding the Euripides easy to follow? Oh, not so bad, he said, and he proceeded to quote in Greek from the chorus we had just heard, those lines about blood upon blood, murder upon murder, not leaving go of the two sons of Atreus. There was something odd about his pronunciation. It was far from barbarous, all the qualities were correct, but I had never heard anything quite like it before. He spoke in a hieratic tone, as if pronouncing a liturgy. His style reminded me most of a performance I had once seen in Tokyo, of the No drama. I was too astounded to react in any other way than to bow respectfully. After a moment of silence, I said, Were you wanting to see me about something? I left an envelope for you with the portrait at your college said Mr. Pixney, and then, quite pointedly, turned his back on me. On returning to my own college, St. Jude's, I asked at the porter's lodge if there was anything for me, and our porter, George, handed me a large manila envelope. Usually George has plenty to say for himself, but on this occasion, for some reason, loquaciousness had deserted him. In my rooms I opened the envelope and took out a print, similar but not identical to the one Mr. Pigsney had shown us on the day of the funeral. There was the lowering sky of dirty cloud, the frozen lake, the distant horned peaks. The figure of Reg was still on the ice in the foreground, but something had happened to him. The lower part of his body had begun to diliquesce into a dark, slug-like shape that seemed fixed by frozen bonds to the lake. 
The body's dark viscosity was beginning to extend into the features of the face, stretching and distorting them in strange ways. The head was still recognisably Redger's, and his expression was that of a drowning man just about to go under for the last time, and knowing it. As before, the scene was depicted with the meticulous graphic accuracy and a touch of genuine artistic flair which only made it more obscene. I could not bear to look at it, but at the same time I felt somehow that to destroy it would amount to a betrayal of the trust Reg had placed in me. I rolled up the print and placed it carefully in Reg's Ming vase. My bedroom in college looks over one of the quads, and usually I sleep soundly, but that night I was restless. I did eventually fall asleep, but it seemed to me I woke up again almost immediately. I listened. Was it a noise that had woken me? No. All was silent. Then the silence was disturbed by a faint sound. It was not one of the usual ones that occasionally afflict a Cambridge quadrangle late at night, like drunken laughter or argument or a sudden blast of pop music. It was the sound of a single flute playing a lively dance tune. Its note sequences were vaguely familiar, sometimes Irish in feel, sometimes gypsy-like or mid-European, perhaps even Middle Eastern at moments, but ultimately belonging to none of these cultures. The rhythm was a kind of jig, I think, but I am no musical expert. Its tone was cold, as if blown not through reed and wood, but granite and cold steel, and it was compelling enough to make me get up and look out of my window and into the quad. The world outside my window was flooded with moonlight, and on the grass in the centre of the quadrangle was a short man in a suit, dancing and blowing on some sort of instrument. I knew it at once to be Pigsney, even though his strange coppery hair was not lying flat on his cranium, but sticking up from it in ragged peaks. They shimmered slightly, as if he had covered them with gel. Because he was on grass, it was only to be expected that his leaps and capers should be entirely silent. But still it seemed strange. He had a grace and an extraordinary vitality for a little fat man. The flute music stopped. Mr. Pigsney made one final leap into the air, landed with a kind of pirouette, and then bowed low in my direction, as if he had known all along that I was watching. I hurried down from my rooms to catch him, but, as I had expected, he had gone when I reached the quad. The college gates had been locked for well over an hour. Who had given him a key? The following day I rang Den to ask if he had seen Mr. Pixney, and was on the receiving end of a torrent of bad language, at the end of which he said, What was that fucker playing at, eh? Eh? Went to the dog and gibber the other night. Need to show my face there now and again to stop him getting out of order. Horace, you know, the Oxton Strangler, and he need were having a knees up to celebrate their silver. And there was a Cayley band. And bugger me if that Pigsney bastard wasn't in it playing the flute. Then he did one of those Irish step dance things. Doing a fucking step dance in my effing pub. If it wasn't for Horace and he need, I'd have had him slung out on his ass. Did you put him up to this? Of course not. Then what are you calling me for? I briefly told him of my recent experiences. Den said, Yeah, I had one of those stupid prints. I mean, what's it all about? It must be some kind of a wind-up. I mean, what is this hell crap, hey? What the bloody hell is that all about, eh? When you're dead, you're bloody dead. End of story. It's all a piss-take. And I seriously do not like having the piss taken. Den was not going to be of help to me. I could see that. My irritation with Pigsney was no less than his, but I needed some kind of explanation. As an epigraphist, I am, in my own way, a man of science. Mr. Pigsney may have been a madman, but even madness has its reasons. I rang up my sister to see if she could help me. 
Once a wayward and slender beauty, Gwen had grown over the years into a rather solid woman, a stalwart on all the committees in the Buckinghamshire village where she lived. She came to the phone rather breathlessly. Hello? Sorry about that. We're in the middle of a garden crisis. I've called in Parker, who does our garden on Fridays, usually. There's a slug invasion. It's all hands to the pumps. I've even got the boys setting beer traps. She sounded hearty and conventional. Marriage to a merchant banker had undoubtedly changed her, but not necessarily for the better. I told her what I wanted, which was the telephone number of Reg's widow, Maureen. Oh, really, Lawrence? Can't you get it off din? Frankly, Lawrence, I do not want to know. That wretched little Maureen woman has been ringing me up and saying that I should meet a friend of hers called Mr. Piggy or something. He sounds perfectly dreadful. Apparently he's a kind of spiritualist. I couldn't really understand what she was saying. Well, I told her very firmly that we were all Church of England here, which shut her up. But I mean, really? Patiently, I asked her again for the number, and she went off to get it. When she had given it to me, she said, "'Don't you get me involved again with that awful little woman. "'I have quite enough to contend with, what with these slugs. "'What they have done to my courgettes is quite literally unspeakable.' "'It took me some days before I had the courage to ring Maureen. "'It was not her I was afraid of, naturally, but what she might tell me. "'And what might she tell me? "'I had no idea.' That was the problem. Fear is the shadow of the unknown. When I finally got round to phoning her, I came straight to the point and asked her about Mr. Pigsney. Maureen is one of those people who finds it hard to answer any question directly. I had to disentangle the information she gave me from a litany of complaints about Den's handling of Reg's estate, how so few people had been in touch with her after Reg's death, how she was not receiving the respect she felt she was owed. Apparently the one person who had behaved himself to her satisfaction had been Mr. Pigsney, though, like Den, and for that matter myself, she was not at all sure what he was up to. She told me that about a year before he died, Reg had begun to take an interest in spiritualism and the afterlife. Ostensibly his main object was to get in touch with their daughter Janet, who had died in a car crash, though Maureen suspected that the knowledge of his own impending death had played a part. He had visited various psychics and spiritualist churches, and was at one of these meetings when he had encountered Mr. Pigsney. As far as she knew, Pigsney was not an established psychic or medium with a following, but he had impressed Reg with his wide understanding of occult matters. Reg had once told her that Mr. Pigsney knew more about the spirit world than all those other bullshit artists put together. For the last few months of Reg's life, the two men had been virtually inseparable. Mr. Pigsney had come to stay in their house, though he had always made himself scarce when other people like Den came visiting. As far as she knew, there had been no financial transactions between Reg and Pigsney, though she did think that Reg had signed some sort of document. Maureen said that after Reg's death, Mr. Pigsney had continued to come to the house. He was able to reassure her that Reg was doing all right in the afterlife and had met up with his daughter, Janet. I don't know, though, said Maureen finally. I mean... I don't hold with this afterlife business, do you? It's so, like, unnecessary, isn't it? I mean, this life's bad enough, really. You don't want any more of it after. Do you know what I mean? The whole thing gives me the creeps. I told him straight. He seemed to understand, and he told me he was arranging things so I wouldn't have to worry. Then he wanted me to sign something so he could guarantee no worries. Sign what exactly? Well, I don't know, really. It was all in funny writing, like the olden times. I said I wasn't sure about this signing business. Anyway, he took the paper away, saying he'd come back another time. I said, before you sign anything, tell Mr. Pigsney I want to see him and talk to him. She agreed at once to this, and appeared to be relieved that I had taken the matter out of her hands. A few days later, I was taking a shortcut across the fellow's garden on my way to a seminar. 
There was enough time, I thought, to greet Nichols, the college gardener, who I thought was looking rather disconsolate. I asked him what was the matter. "'We've been invaded, that's what,' he said in his distinctive, laconic fashion. He pointed to the bed of gloxinias and hostas, in which he took a special pride. Even I could tell they were in a bad way. The leaves had been gnawed into shreds by some creature or other. "'Slugs?' said Nichols, pointing to an unusually large specimen, dark and glutinous. With one neat thrust he bisected it with a spade. "'I've put down beer traps and caught dozens, but they keep coming. Where are they from?' I expressed bewilderment and sympathy in the best way I could, and began to move off to my seminar. "'If you see one of them bastards, Professor, you bloody well smash em, said Nichols. I said I would not fail him, hoping devoutly that the eventuality would not arise. As I was returning from my seminar across the main quad, our porter George approached and informed me that there was someone at the lodge asking to see me. Something about his look told me he was more than unusually troubled. I was therefore not surprised to find little Mr. Pigsney pretending to study a notice board under the great entrance arch of St. Jude's. "'Come to my rooms,' I said. As we walked there, Mr. Pigsney trotted beside me, chatting inconsequentially about the weather and other trivial topics. I was conscious of him deliberately keeping the talk light and free of significance— perhaps to tease or torment me in some way. One thing he said, however, struck a different note. Your college here, St. Jude's, it's always been a favourite of mine. Really? I said. In what way? Oh, I've been familiar with it over the years. Did you know about Dr. Barnsworth committing suicide in your rooms? I was shocked. Yes, I had heard about Barnsworth, but it was well before my time, over sixty years ago. What about Barnsworth? I said angrily. Oh, nothing, said Mr. Pixney. Some people have claimed it was some sort of erotic strangulation. But it wasn't, you know. After that we walked to my rooms in silence. It was a bright, hot day, and the windows of my rooms were open, so that the faint murmur of normality could be distinctly heard from the quad below. I offered Mr. Pigsney a sherry, the only drink I had available, but he refused. So I then asked him for an explanation. Of what, he asked. I repeated the catalogue, from his appearance in my quad and at the Greek play, to the prince and the paper he wanted Maureen to sign. "'You people always want an explanation, don't you?' said Mr. Pigsney. "'Well, what if there isn't an explanation? "'Or what if there is one, but I couldn't make you understand it? "'Not in a million years. "'What if just there aren't words in the poxy English language "'to express a meaning, you boneheaded little shit?' "'I think there was a long silence after this.' or perhaps it was the shock I felt which made it long in my memory. When he began again, his speech was low and level, almost too quiet to hear, but not quite. Your friend Reg wanted an explanation, so I gave him what he wanted. He wanted to know if there was life beyond death, so I told him that he might never die. But he wanted a guarantee that he would never die, so I gave it to him. He signed, and he had it. He wanted folks here to go on worrying and thinking about him. He wanted people to go on saying he was a diamond geezer, so I gave it to him. What a muppet! What a moron! As if anybody gives a damn! I do, I said. No, you do don't. You're like the rest. You couldn't give a toss. All you care about is that stupid Ming vase he gave you. Anyway, what's it to you? He got what he wanted, didn't he? Got what he deserved? He'll never die. He'll never, never die. He'll crawl on his knees through shit, begging for death, fucking begging for it, but he'll never, never bloody die. By this time, Mr. Pigsney's voice had risen to a shrill scream, and he was dancing about the room, thundering on the floorboards so that I could feel them bowing under his weight. Stop! I shouted. 
He did so, and for a long time we stood, staring at each other without speaking, while the breath went rasping in and out of Mr. Pigsney's stunted little body. Then Mr. Pigsney opened his mouth wide but this time out of it came no speech or noise, only a vast writhing darkness. His mouth widened still further, and I saw that it was filled with slugs, boiling and wriggling like the tormented souls they were. Soon they were spilling onto one of my precious rugs in great vomited legions, some great, some small, all of a blackish colour, but carrying a faint iridescent sheen of red and green and blue. The larger slugs had faces, which bore the semblance of humanity, traces of the cruelty and lust they had once fondled in life. There was no sound but the rustling, seething sound of Mr. Pigsney's possessed souls as he belched them into my Cambridge study. Did I really see this? Or did I see it with the eyes of madness and illusion? I only know that I saw and nothing else. I only know that what I saw filled me with white rage and the strength of seven men, so that I picked up Mr. Pigsney almost without effort and threw him out of my open window into the quad. For some seconds I was in a daze, horrified at what I had done. I did not dare look out of the window, but stared only at the floor where the writhing slugs were slowly evaporating into foul-smelling smoke, leaving behind several dark, glutinous stains on my lovely Baccara rug. The college servant who cleans my rooms has complained to me bitterly about it several times, but I have offered him neither apology nor explanation. When finally I looked out of the window, I saw that a crowd of curious undergraduates had gathered round the place where Mr. Pigsney must have fallen. It was onto the flagstone path that surrounds the grass of the quadrangle, and not onto the soft earth. Mr. Pigsney could not have survived the fall without, at the very least, suffering very serious injuries. The crowd looked up and saw me, and as they did so, I caught a glimpse of what they were surrounding. It was not the body of Mr. Pigsney at all. On the pavement lay the shattered fragments of the Ming vase that Reg had left me in his will. "'Dear me,' I said fatuously for the benefit of the spectators, "'what a terrible thing!' and hurried downstairs to clear away the shards. By the time I reached the quad, most of the crowd had dispersed. Cambridge takes eccentricity in its stride, and if my conduct in throwing a priceless vase out of my window was regarded as odd— No one, happily, thought it warranted more than a raised eyebrow. I began to pick up the fragments of the vase and put them in a plastic bag I had thoughtfully grabbed on the way out of my rooms. As I did so, I heard flute music. My heart seemed to stop. But then I noticed that it was coming from the open window of our organ scholar. I could even see him innocently playing. I returned to my gathering of the shards. It was then that I discovered a roll of paper lying on the grass beside the shattered Ming. It was the print that I had put inside the vase, the print which Mr. Pigsney had left for me at the porter's lodge after the Greek play. I took it up with me to examine at leisure in my rooms. The picture was, in many ways, as before. Under a lowering sky of thick, dirty cloud was stretched a vast frozen lake. Its distant edges were fringed with jagged, pitiless mountains whose peaks and ridges were laced with snow. But there were no figures on the frozen lake, neither in the foreground nor the middle distance. Nothing now relieved the perfect desolation and loneliness of the scene. I might even have thought of framing it and hanging it up as a curiosity, but the condition of the print was marred irrevocably. It was crisscrossed by lines of some dark, viscous, oily substance, which looked to me like the trails of slugs. 